It is interesting that just last week, the IMF World Bank meetings were held in Washington, and once again, world financial leaders came together in a sincere effort to find solutions to end the economic malaise that many countries seem unable to escape. Despite a myriad of reforms proposed or implemented subsequent to the financial crisis of 2008, we seem unable to escape its pull. The debate continues over whether we have done enough to assure a stable financial environment supportive of growth. What kinds of incentives, fiscal conditions, central bank actions, legal frameworks, asset exposures, correlations, and institutional interconnections must we address to assure a global financial market that works as it should through good times and bad? The issues are now truly grow global in nature. There are a host of possible causes affecting the world's recovery and are worth discussing here today. My perspective is one of economic incentives and the important role they played leading up to the crisis and how they continue to affect events, making a fuller recovery more difficult to achieve than any of us want. I will focus in part on monetary policy and its longer run effects on the economic environment within which financial firms operate. I will also offer my perspective of the effects of government guarantees on firm and market behavior and steps that remain to be taken if, in my opinion at least, we are to achieve a more robust and stable growth path for world economies. It's a tall order, I realize. Let me start with monetary policy. We all understand the fundamental role of money as a store of value and medium of exchange. However, we have come to expect more of it. We have modified and expanded its role, captured its effect in short-term interest rates, and found it can influence the economy broadly to stimulate or control economic activity. Central banks in pushing interest rates below a long-term equilibrium level have stimulated economic activity and achieved goals of higher employment. The perceived success of this tool has convinced the Federal Reserve policymakers and others in the world to broaden their mandate to include the objective of full employment, not just price stability. Monetary policy is, in fact, a powerful tool. But as we all know, tools, when used too frequently, too intensively perhaps, can bring harm as well as benefit. Monetary policy over this past half century has contributed to economic growth. But all too often, it appears to have contributed to increased financial volatility and crisis. And this should be not lost on today's policymakers. As one measure of the accommodation of monetary policy in the United States at least, over the, half pa over the last uh, half century, the real Fed funds rate in the United States has been held below the growth rate of real GDP for over 70% of the time. Coincidentally, and I say only coincidentally, over this period, the U.S. price level has increased by over six times. The U.S. suffered through a dramatic recession and banking crisis of the 1980s as inflation nearly overwhelmed the economy. Most recently, accommodative policies pursued just prior to the Great Recession in an effort to bring unemployment below 6.5% has seen instead it eventually rise to over 10% in the 2009 period. Despite this mixed record, monetary policy once again is the preferred means to attempt to stimulate economies. The world is awash in liquidity and its effects have yet to play out fully within world markets. Stock values and long-term asset prices are increasing rapidly. The incentives around low interest rates and rising asset pricing invites portfolio shifts into longer-term assets as, retur as returns demand that greater risk be taken. The effects of such monetary policy we, have, we, we know can be slow in coming. But if allowed to continue unchecked for an extended period, will sow the seeds of instability. History is full of examples which should not be ignored and forgotten soon.
then on another level, we learned in the most recent financial crisis that one of the greatest threats to stability is the concentration and complexity of the world's largest financial institutions and the systemic risk they sometimes pose. In the midst of the 2008 financial crisis, regulators worldwide took actions needed to stabilize the system. However, their actions have left us with an even more highly concentrated, complex, and interrelated financial system, which is more difficult to regulate and which poses an even greater threat to financial stability for the future unless we are very careful in how we oversee them. The change in, the con in concentration over time has been quite dramatic. Let's take the United States, for example. In 1997, the top four U.S. bank holding companies had total assets equal to approximately 4% of GDP. By 2006, the number had grown to 14%, and by the end of 2012, to 50%. For a country with both a large GDP and a large number of banks, concentration of this magnitude is impressive to say the least and yet even these large numbers fail to compare or capture the off balance sheet positions of these institutions that make this even more dramatic. This leaves to incentives. This concentration of resources and risk has intensified market vulnerabilities to individual firms and has led to a steady, very steady extension of government protections to creditors of these largest banking firms. It has changed the fundamental incentive structure, driving firm behavior and the function of the markets within which they operate. The more we study the implications of size, concentration, and interconnectivity of firms to systemic risk, the more convinced we, or at least I am, that these factors remain a threat to financial stability and sustained growth. This protection of their creditors enables global firms to borrow at lower cost, a subsidy related to size and complexity that has been documented. Numerous studies have, have, have identified the existence of this subsidy and its effects on firm behavior and financial risk. Also, while the subsidy varies depending on the state of the economy, its greatest value occurs under severe economic stress. Andrew Haldane of the Bank of England estimated that there was an annual subsidy of about $70 billion that grew 10 times to $700 billion at the peak of the crisis in 2009. The ability of the largest firms to increase the financial system's risk profile has been facilitated and extended with the adoption of the Basel Capital Standards, which I am a critic of. These standards represent a global cooperative effort to set capital standards that would better account for banks' risk portfolio, thus making banking more market sensitive and more stable. That's the goal. Unfortunately, to be successful, such an effort requires an ability on the part of the central authorities to measure and anticipate shifts in risk that are beyond its capacity to do. Too often this effort systematically misallocates risk weights encouraging investments, which in hindsight hold risk unrelated to the assigned weights. The outcomes from these efforts have been disastrous for world economies as high risk or sometimes politically influential risk uh, uh, assignments uh, have put too low a weight on some of the more risky assets. Basel also is too easily uh, manipulated by firms and their, uh, in, uh, in addressing their balance sheets to enable greater leverage in an attempt to increase short-term return on equity. Many of the largest firms in the world report Basel Tier 1 risk-weighted capital ratios of 12% or higher, giving the impression of a strong capital environment. However, when all, sets, uh, when all assets are counted, not just risk-weighted assets, but when all assets are counted and only tangible equity is treated as capital, their ratios, this leverage ratio, falls to as little as 3% or maybe 4. This too little capital leaves the largest firms vulnerable to any significant economic shock they might encounter and therefore risk the larger economic environment itself. So incentives matter and financial, ma 
and financial managers, unless they are highly disciplined, often react too quickly to the incentives placed before them. Driven importantly by the incentives and market conditions outlined above, managers booked an unprecedented degree of risk over the decade leading up to the crisis of 2008. Highly accommodated monetary policy with, with sustained low interest rates created an almost insatiable appetite for credit. The safety net within the U.S. at least, one of the largest markets in which financial products traded, was extended to an ever wider array of activities and firms. These markets were deregulated and liberalized, thus providing a vast supply of new financial products to meet this demand. Almost simultaneously, capital standards worldwide were dramatically eased, inviting an unprecedented degree of leverage within the global financial system. These conditions introduced an almost overwhelming opportunity for bank directors and managers to enhance return on equity by adding risk to their balance sheets at discounted costs. Banks globally manufactured debt securities and created complex derivatives such as CDOs and CDO squared to generate trading incomes and fees that were record. These managers leveraged their bank's balance sheets from levels of 15 to 1 to 30 to 40 and even to 50 to 1 in some instances. Those in the market who should have provided the discipline against such actions have become complacent as they felt secure under the notion that the government would bail them out as a last resort. And finally, and importantly, compensation tied to short-term returns not only perpetuated but exaggerated the advantages of leverage for managers to the detriment of these institutions when problems became apparent. With little market oversight and too little board and management self-discipline, the financial industry self-destructed and we continue to experience its effects today in much of the world. These incentives, therefore, contributed in no small way to the Great Recession. More importantly today, for the law, all the laws and regulations that have been followed from this recession, many of these incentives remain in place. So we have to change the incentives, not just add to the regulation. To begin to address these issues, we should change these incentives, not just add to these regulations in the expectation that this alone can control outcomes. There is pressure building to change the course of monetary policy. World central banks, it appears at least, recognize that tapering down the current level of monetary accommodation may be in order. I would agree with this view. It would be advantageous to do so in such a way as to avoid the excesses that often follow an extended period of highly accommodated monetary policy. While we would all agree this has to be done with care to avoid an overly harsh market reaction, it should be done soon to avoid the creation of too fragile an economy dependent on an unrealistic interest rate policy near zero. In addition, so long as the largest banks receive a government guarantee, explicit or implied, they should be limited in the kinds of activities they are allowed to conduct within that guarantee. Authorities are beginning to address this issue in the form of the Volcker Rule in the United States, the Vickers Ring Fencing in the UK, and the Lickenden Proposal for Europe. I would propose going a bit further, maybe a lot further, to separate fully the safety nets coverage for these high-risk activities. Trading and other broker-dealer activities should be conducted in completely separate corporate entities where they can be disciplined by the market, innovate within the market, and be successful or fail on their own merits. And finally, the Basel Capital Standards should be revamped and prioritized using a tangible leverage ratio as the principal measure of capital across banks and across countries. The risk-weighted standards could be a secondary standard to judge bank concentrations of risk within the overall balance sheet. These steps would do much to change the incentives driving management's actions. They would place markets at greater risk of loss, forcing them to play a more direct role disciplining excess risk-taking in the broader global market playing field. Management and markets respond to the incentives placed before them. Change the incentives, you will change the outcome. So let me conclude. 
There is no single solution to prosperity, and there are more policy areas to address than what I've outlined in my few minutes here today. Obviously, fiscal policy plays no small role in determining an economy's stability and strength. The overall regulatory structure within which global firms operate is of significant importance in defining boundaries of firms' behavior and assuring accountability. Still, incentives matter, and how we define the role of monetary policy in setting the overall credit conditions within an economy will have an enormous effect on performance. How we choose to subsidize and protect our largest firms will define their long-run impact on economic events within our economies. We have taken some steps to correct these errors, but if current conditions and emerging risk are any indication, I suggest we still need to do more, and I encourage us all to begin that process soon. Thank you all very much for your attention. <laughs>